Today we'll be going through chapter 6 together. We will talk about Squanto, the friendly Indian, and the first Thanksgiving. Have you ever had Thanksgiving? In America, it's a very big thing. Maybe you have had what is called Chusok in Korea. So we will talk about the first time that the Americans celebrated Thanksgiving. Let's start. Thanksgiving is a reminder of a wonderful friendship that developed between the pilgrims and a group of Native Americans. Sadly, this was not always the case, as Europeans came to claim the lands these tribes had called their own for generations. <clears throat> the Thanksgiving Feast Thanksgiving is one of America's favorite national holidays. Everyone loves a big turkey dinner and pumpkin pie. But what are we really celebrating? So here you can see what the American Thanksgiving meal looks like. This is what they eat at every Thanksgiving. Are you ready to explore more? Number one. How did a kind Native American help the pilgrims survive in America? And two, how did Thanksgiving become a national holiday? Who was responsible for making it so? As always, you can find the answers to these questions at the end of this chapter. So now we will be looking at page 56. 57 and 58, so you can follow with me on the screen with your book. So you can turn to page 56. So let's travel back in time to the year 1605. This was two years before Captain John Smith and the other Englishmen settled Jamestown and 15 years before the pilgrims came to America. In this year, a young boy named Squanto was taken by Captain George Weymouth to England. So he, he, this, this boy Squanto was taken on a ship to go all the way from here to England. Squanto was the nephew of an Indian chief of the Portuxet. While he was in England, Squanto learned to speak English very well and made friends with many Englishmen. So you could maybe speak to, to Squanto because you also speak English. But he missed his home and his family. He was homesick. Do you see the sadness on his face? He was homesick. He was missing his home. One day, Squanto met Captain John Smith, who had recently been to the New World, or America. Squanto told the captain how much he wished he could go home. This is North America. He really wanted to go home. They became good friends and made plans for Squanto to go back home. Now you can turn to page 57 and follow with me. Two years later, Squanto went back to America, as you see here, on the ship. He was so happy. He looked forward to being back home. While Squanto was running through the forest to get back home, to his tribe, men appeared out of nowhere and kidnapped him. Squanto and several other Indian men were forced to go on a ship. It was Captain Hunt's ship. He was taking Squanto to Europe to sell him as a slave. They wanted money. When they arrived in Europe, Squanto and the other men were taken to an auction to be sold. So this is a place where people 
by slaves and whoever says the highest price can get the slave. So that's where they were. But a priest came and asked the auction to end. He didn't want the Indians to be sold as slaves. The priest was surprised to hear Squanto speak English. He was a kind man and he brought Squanto to his monastery. This is what a monastery looks like. It's where monks live, people who are seeking God. They became good friends and planned for Squanto to get back home. So again, he was going to go back to, the, to America with the help of his friend, the priest. So he got on the ship again. And when he arrived in America, he ran through the forest again. He tried to find his family, but when he arrived at his village, everything was empty and there were no people. So his village was gone. Nothing was there. How do you think Squanto felt at that moment? He must have been really shocked and surprised. So he thought, maybe they moved to a better hunting place. So he started to walk towards the stream, wondering where his family could be. As he walked away, he met another Indian. By the way, you can find this on page 58. So he met another Indian and asked the Indian, do you know what happened to the Potuxet tribe? But the Indian answered, everyone from that tribe died. A strange sickness went through and killed everyone. Oh no, so that means Squanto's family was dead. All his whole tribe was dead. So Squanto, can you imagine what he was feeling? He was very sad, of course. And the other man, the other Indian, saw his distress and offered to take Squanto home with him. So they went away together. Can you imagine what would have happened if Squanto had stayed with his tribe, with his family? Yes, he would have died too. He would also be dead. But God saved his life. So let's continue to the next page. At the village of his new friend, Squanto met another Indian who could speak English. Somerset and Squanto became good friends. He told Squanto about a group of strange people who had seemed to blow in off of the ocean the winter before. These people, who called themselves pilgrims, had suffered great hunger and sickness. Do you remember the pilgrims? They had lost many of their loved ones, including children and babies. Somerset told Squanto how he had gone to their village to see if, if he could help. But the people seemed to distrust him, so the people didn't know if they could trust Somerset. Here you see a drawing of Somerset who came to the village of the pilgrims to talk to them. But they look a little bit afraid and not really sure how to answer him. Squanto decided to go to the white man's village. He spoke clearly in English, telling the pilgrims his story. They believed God had sent Squanto to them, and they trusted him. Squanto showed the pilgrims how to hunt and fish like Indians. They did not know how to plant gardens in this new land. The vegetables and fruits that they had planted in their gardens in England would not grow in the soil here. 
They were very thankful for the help from their new Indian friend. Squanto showed them how to plant corn, fertilizing it with fish remains to help it grow. He showed them how to plant squash and pumpkins, which were new foods to them. The pilgrims planted large gardens and worked hard to bring home enough meat to dry and smoke for the winter. They finished the houses in their small village, which they had named Plymouth Colony. The warm summer and good nutrition work worked wonders for them, and they grew strong and healthy. So thanks to Squanto, they could eat well and they could become stronger and healthier. Squanto had helped and work alongside his new friends all summer. He was happy he could do something to help this group of kind pilgrims. Knowing he could help save them from dying in the cold winter made him feel better. He still missed his family, but he was glad to be home in the wilderness. The pilgrims' crops were so plentiful that they decided to hold a feast to thank God for bringing them to this new world and for providing them with a friend who had helped them so much. The air was alive with excitement. What a party this was going to be! So, when you have a Thanksgiving Day feast at your house, does it last for several days? So think about the Chusok, what is that like for you? It's a little different, of course, than Thanksgiving, but how long is it? It probably doesn't, so it probably doesn't last a few days. Even though you may eat Thanksgiving leftovers for a week afterward. The pilgrims' Thanksgiving feast was not just one day, though. In fact, the festivities went on for about a week. Squanto, Somerset, and many other Indians came to the feast as well. Imagine the surprise on the pilgrims' faces when, out of the forest, came brightly painted Indian braves carrying deer and turkeys over their shoulders. Can you just see the pilgrim boys and girls learning the games of the Indian children? What a party they had! Here you see a picture of what's that first Thanksgiving looked like. And there is also a picture here, what it looked like. So you see there are the Indians and they are together with the pilgrims. And they always had a feast. So what is a feast? A feast is a large meal, usually in celebration of something. So they ate a lot. I wish I could hear the prayer of thanksgiving they offered up to God that day. I can imagine it was full of gratitude for bringing them to this beautiful and bountiful land. I think it may have been very similar to the prayer that the children of Israel prayed after they entered the promised land. So let's have a little narration break. Now you can retell in your own words how God save, used Squanto to help save the pilgrims. What did he do? So you can think about it. And as always, remember to do the next pages on your own. So sometimes I do the pages with you, sometimes I don't. But this time, remember to do the next pages and you can, as always, see the, some more pictures and get the answers to the questions on the first page of the chapter. So remember the next pages and remember to answer this question. And I will see you in the next chapter, in chapter seven. <laughs>
Today we will talk about life in the colonies. So starting point. While the eastern coast of America was home to the first colonies, the lives of the colonists differed based on the natural resources of the areas they lived in. Whether you became a slave owner or shipbuilder could be determined in part by the area in which you lived. These colonists sometimes faced harsh conditions and struggles defending their individual beliefs. So we will see how it, depending on where the colonists live or lived, the things that they did were a little bit different and their lifestyle was different. The Salem Witch Trials Remembered The Salem Witch Trials were a dark event in America's history. And here is the Salem Witch Museum. You know what a witch is, right? We often see them in movies or fairy tales. So we will talk about this more in the last pages of this chapter. Are you ready to explore? Number one, what was the colonial American life like? And number two, what was the Great Awakening? So keep your eyes open for these answers in the next pages and you can turn with me to the next page to page 66. So here is just a little summary of the first paragraph, so we can read it together. There were more and more settlements on the coast of North America. They were loyal to England because they were governed and protected by the English government. So most of the settlements were over here on this side of the coast, as you can see on the map. And everything that was west of this coast, it was still wild country. So there were Indians living here, but no settlements. The colonists were not over here. This was land that only brave people went in because most people were afraid to come in this land. So people usually stayed here. The colonies were divided into three main sections. The most northern colonies were the New England colonies. Maine, which was governed by Massachusetts. New Hampshire, which also partly governed Vermont. Massachusetts, where Plymouth was settled. Rhode Island and Connecticut. So these ones that are up north. And if you look on a map of a modern map of America, you will see that many of these colonies still have the same name today. So let's continue to page 67. Next were the middle colonies made up of New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Delaware. So these ones were over here, the middle ones. These colonies were made up of the most diverse group of people. Diverse means different kinds and from different places. These colonists were Dutch, French, English, Irish, Swedish, Scottish and Welsh. Of course, all from Europe. That is quite a variety of settlers, isn't it? Many people, many different kinds of people. Find the middle colonies on your map while I tell you an interesting story about a place that I am sure you have heard of. So we already looked at where they are on the map. This story is about a large city named New York City. I am sure you have already heard of New York it is a really huge city nowadays. It is one of the largest cities in the world, 
with millions upon millions of people living in and near it. Running through the city is the Hudson River. This river was named after an English explorer named Henry Hudson. In 1609, only two years after Jamestown was settled, Mr. Hudson, working for the Dutch government, was on a mission to sail through the continent of North America. Doesn't that sound silly? Nobody at that time had any idea how big our continent really is. So he believed that he could sail from here and cross the continent with his boat. He thought that there must be a way to go from here to here by boat. But of course, he didn't know how big North America is. So indeed, nobody at that time had any idea how big our continent really is. Henry Hudson sailed up and down the coast, looking and looking for a way to sail into the continent. So he was going up and down, trying to find where can I go, where can I find enough water that will lead me through the continent. Finally, he came to what seemed to be a good passageway to try. What he had found is now the Long Island Sound, but he didn't know that it would not take him through the continent. He sailed along and realized that he was on a river. Now he was quite certain that he was going to sail through the great continent of America. So he was around here and he found a large river going this direction. But he didn't know it was just a river. So he thought if he goes this way, it will lead him to the other side of the continent. But what do you think happened? Well, eventually he tried enough times that his men were rather tired of it all. On one of their ventures, Henry Hudson was removed from his ship and left behind on a small boat while his men returned the way they had come. So Henry Hudson really thought that he could, that he could go through the continent and he kept trying and trying and going through that river but the men with him gave up they said this is crazy so they left henry hudson on a little boat no one knows what became of henry hudson so no one knows what happened to him and of course nobody ever sailed through the entire continent hudson did accomplish something important though he opened the door for the Dutch to explore that area. In 1624, the Dutch started a settlement that they named New Amsterdam. Later, the English took control of the small city and renamed it after the Duke of York. Today, we know that city as New York City. To the south of the Middle Colonies was another group of colonies called the Southern Colonies. Maryland, Virginia, North and South Carolina and Georgia made up this section. Look on your map of the 13 colonies. Do you see these names? So can you see over here all these names? Virginia is the oldest of all the English colonies, because that is where Jamestown was settled in 1607. So this one is the oldest. Let's continue. Do you remember earlier in our story how the European explorers opened the door for settling the Americas? That was when slave ships started coming to America. The first was in 1503, about 200 years back in time in our story. By the middle of the 1700s, there were more Africans than Europeans or Native Americans living in some of the southern colonies. 
In these colonies, there were many large farms called plantations, which produced huge crops of tobacco and cotton. The taxes on these crops meant a lot of money from England. So because of the work that they were making in those fields and plantations, England was getting a lot of money. But the sad thing is, Africans were taken from their homes and brought to the Americas on slave ships. And they were treated very poorly, very badly. In this picture or drawing, you see a slave ship in the distance. This is where the African came. Uh, the Africans came. Slave traders in England, Spain and Portugal were becoming very rich on the sale of humans and England was getting rich from the crops grown with slave labour. Slavery is not a fun part of history to learn about, but just like many things in history, it is important to know about. Unless we learn about history, we can't learn from history. So we need to learn from the mistakes of the past. As we travel down our winding path of history, we will see how slavery grew in America. We need to remember, though, that even back in the 1700s, there were people who did not like slavery and were working hard to stop it. Slavery is a large puzzle piece in our country's history. In a big way, Africans who were brought here against their wishes helped build our country. So let's have a little narration break. And now it's your turn. Tell why there are so many parts to and people involved in the story of how America was settled. So can you can you say in your own words what you learned about America in this first part of the chapter? Just try and then we will continue together. Okay, if you need more time, you can pause the video. But if not, let's continue together. We are going to take our story's path from the southern colonies with their huge plantations of cotton and tobacco back north to the northern colonies. I want to tell you a story about something that happened in the colony of Massachusetts the home of the Pilgrims Plymouth settlement. The name Massachusetts is taken from the name of an Indian tribe that lived in that area. Many of the people who settled this colony had come to America for religious purposes. The Puritans, as they called themselves, were strict in their religious practices. It is good to be accountable for your decisions and take responsibility for your actions but the Puritans carried this idea a little further than most people do. Many of the villages were strictly run by the church elders and leaders. People were expected to keep track of what their neighbours were doing. And if anyone saw someone breaking the rules, they were to report them. So that means that the village was really looking at everyone. And if someone didn't follow the rules, they were in big trouble. So people were spying on each other. People were watching each other. And if they saw someone do something wrong, they would tell the authority and they would tell what that person did. And that person would be in trouble. Would you like to live in that kind of system where everyone is telling the bad things that everyone does? This kind of system was bound to lead to trouble, and it did. Have you ever said something that wasn't quite true about someone else or had someone do that to you? 
Maybe if you have brothers or sisters, they said something to your parents about you that it wasn't really true. For example, you and you and your brother or sister are are at the in the kitchen and there is a big bowl of candy and your your brother or sister is eating all of the candy but then when your parents come and see that the candy jar is empty they ask who ate all the candy then if your brother or sister says oh it's it's him it's her then how would you feel it's not it's not the truth right how would you feel and have you already done that to other people I remember when I was a little girl, someone did that to me. It didn't matter how much I told the truth about it, everyone believed the other person. I remember being very angry about it when I had to take the punishment for something I had not done. I in turn did something back to the person who lied about me. It turned into a huge problem with both of us getting into a lot of trouble. This is exactly what happened in 1692 in a town called Salem in Massachusetts colony. Nobody really knows why, but several young girls started accusing various people of casting spells on them. So, you know, like a witch, a witch has a magic wand or something like in fairy tales. A magic wand and can cast spells on people with that wand and in this in this drawing you see someone accused of being a witch so everyone here thought that this person is casting spells on people so doing bad things to them and in this story, the girls even acted like they were crazy or having seizures. Like this girl, it looks like she's having a seizure. This was a terrible accusation for the Puritans and one they took very seriously. The accused people were arrested for practicing witchcraft. So that means they were arrested because people thought that they were witches. And followed was a terrible time that would go down in history as the Salem witch trials. So people started to hunt or try to find witches. Over the next year, 19 women and one man accused of witchcraft were put to death. So it was a really bad thing. People were dying because they were believed, because people thought that they were witches. But most of them were innocent. Fear of evil was the real enemy. Even though the girls admitted to, ha to making up the story, it was too late. No one would listen to them. After all the sadness of slavery and witchcraft trials, I think we need to have a happy story to end our chapter, don't you? Well, I have just such a story for you. In the 1740s, about 50 years after the Salem witch trials, something wonderful happened in the colonies. Do you know what a spiritual revival is? It is when an awakening to God moves through the hearts of thousands of people. So when, when people can really connect with God and when God really speaks to their hearts. Many of the original colonists had come to the new world looking for a place of religious freedom. But over a hundred years later, the great grandchildren of those people thought of religion and church just as something good people did. So they didn't really believe in it. They just thought it was good. 
Many of them did not know God as the living God that he truly is. God always has someone to do his special work when he wants it done. At this time in history, the spotlight was on a man named Reverend Jonathan Edwards. God used Reverend Edwards to turn many colonial hearts towards him. Edwards gathered great crowds. The crowds were so large that many times he had to hold services outside because there were not big enough churches to hold them all. Many people were touched by the Holy Spirit and gave their hearts to Jesus. Isn't it wonderful that God loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to be our saviour and friend? I am enjoying our journey through history so much. Thank you for sticking with me through this chapter. So many things in life are hard to, un to understand, and we touched on some of them today. Even though we will be revisiting the hard topic of slavery again soon, our next chapter will be a little more light-hearted. We will meet a man who brought peace between the Indians and the white settlers and established a city of brotherly love. So let's have another narration break. Tell about the Salem witchcraft trials and the Great Awakening. So this means the revival that we just talked about. So I want you to use your own words to, to tell about this. And when you finish, please look at the next pages on your own. This time I will not look at them with you. So you can look at the next pages, look at the pictures, the maps, and you can find the answers to the questions on the first page of our chapter at the end of this chapter. So make sure you, you look at the next pages and I will see you in the next chapter. So until next time. Welcome to the new chapter, chapter eight. William Penn, a man of peace. This is the man that we will talk about in this chapter. Let's start with the starting point. The Quakers came to America to find religious freedom as well and, create a, and created a unique colony in the lands of Pennsylvania. Where is Pennsylvania? It is here. William Penn would take a unique approach in dealing with the Native American tribes that lived on the lands that had been given to him by his king. So here is William Penn. Here are also some statues of him in Philadelphia. William Penn remembered. William Penn was a man of peace. He did everything he could to bring the love of Jesus to those around him. So he, he brought Jesus' love to people, including the Native Americans living on the land being colonized by the British. So are you ready to explore? Number one. How were the Native Americans usually treated by the colonists? Number two, why is, the Philadelphia, why is Philadelphia called the city of brotherly love? Let's find out. Do you remember our story of the pilgrims and how they suffered persecution in England because of their religious differences with King James? Today we are going to meet another group of people who suffered in the same way. You may think the name of this group is a little strange. They are called the Quakers. Sadly, this group was mistreated in America as well as in England. They were not treated well. 
Have you ever seen someone who gets picked on or teased because they dress or act differently than others? Sometimes when someone is different from us, it can make us feel uncomfortable. The Quakers had that effect on many people. The cl their clothes got a lot of attention because they were not stylish at all. Instead, they were plain and dark in color. More than their clothing style caused a stir though, the Quakers did not confirm to the Church of England and that made the King of England mad. Many people did not understand the Quakers of England. They were peaceful people who did not believe in war or any kind of violence. They were quiet and kind to their neighbours. The Quakers lived by what is sometimes called the Golden Rule. We are going to learn the story of perhaps one of the most famous Quakers there ever was, William Penn. William was the son of an English admiral who was friends with the royalty of England so with the king and queen or the royal family of England. He was well educated and well brought up. Here you see a meeting of the Quakers in this drawing. So you see also their clothes, which are very dark and very simple. You can see in this picture as well. Let's continue. William was first introduced to the Quaker religion when he was only 13 years old. The religion made an impression on him, for even at his young age, he was not impressed with the Church of England, with all its legalism. Later, he was expelled from Oxford University for not conforming to the church's views because he, didn't, he did not agree with the views or opinion of the Church of England so Oxford University didn't like William Penn. At his father's insistence he attended the Inns of Court and learned about law. In 1667, William officially joined the Quakers, or the Society of Friends, as they call themselves. He was imprisoned four times for writing and speaking about the Quakers' beliefs, but because his father was a friend to the English royalty, so Charles I of England, he was released. That means he was free from prison. King Charles of England owed William's father a large debt of money. So he had to give William Penn's father a lot of money. And after his father died, William became the holder of the debt. That means William was supposed to receive the money. William came up with an idea of how the king could pay it, pay it off. If the king would give him a piece of land on the west side of the Delaware River in America, Penn would consider the debt repaid. So the king would not have to give money if he agrees to give this side of the river. So William wanted to move to America and start a colony for the poor Quakers who suffered so much in England. He wanted to make a home where they could worship the way they chose. Penn went to the King Charles with this idea. The king thought that this was a splendid idea.
that means a very good idea. In fact, he liked it so much he gave Penn a very large piece of land. The only thing King Charles wanted from it was two beaver skins a year and one-fifth of all the gold and silver ever mined there. The king did get his beaver skins, but no gold or silver was ever mined on that land. What is one-fifth of nothing? So they didn't find any gold or silver, so that means they couldn't give any of that to the king. There was a small problem, however. The land did not belong to the king, it belonged to the Indians. And many other groups of settlers had already claimed and settled this land. Years before the Quakers came, settlers from Sweden and Holland had settled along the Delaware River. After that, the English came and said that the land was theirs. This seemed to be a very popular place to claim land. So let's have a small narration break. And you can try to retell the story so far in your own words. So what happened to William? What did he do? Where did he go? What was his relationship with the king? Can you tell the story in your own words? So you can try to do that. And when you finish, we can continue together on the next page. So if you want, you can pause the video and then let's move on. William Penn knew that the land really belonged to the Indians and shortly after arriving in America on a ship called the Welcome, he had a meeting of, the na of Native Americans. Do you think this meeting was a little quiet at first? Can you imagine the Indians standing and staring at this strange white man with an English accent? They were probably glancing or looking at each other with puzzled expressions. Why would he want to talk to us? Their looks would say, I'm sure they were surprised to learn this man wanted, wanted to pay them for the land. William Penn talked to the Indians for a long time. He told them about the Quakers and how they believed in living peacefully. He told them that he was aware the land really belonged to them and that he would pay them for the land the Quakers used. The Indians were impressed and liked William Penn. He drew up peace treaties, which are agreements between two parties not to fight and the Indians gladly signed them. So there was peace. This famous meeting between William Penn and the Indians took place under a spreading elm tree on the Delaware River Bank. Here you see a painting of that moment. This tree stood for more than a hundred years after that meeting. Today, a monument marks the spot where the, trees, where, where the tree once stood. William Penn became a great friend of the Indians, and there was a peace, and there was peace between the Quaker settlers and the Native Americans for quite some time. So for very long, for quite long, there was peace between them. A settlement that quickly grew into a city was built along the, the river. William Penn named it Philadelphia. This name means brotherly love. 
And that is exactly how these peaceful people tried to live. Philadelphia was built along the Delaware River and its streets were built through the forest. If you went to this city today, you would see streets named after these trees. There is a Chestnut Street, a Walnut Street, a Pine Street, a Cherry Street and other tree names as well. The colony of Pennsylvania appealed to many people. That means many people wanted to go there. Who, would, who wouldn't want to live in such a peaceful place? William Penn even wrote advertisements and sent them all over the colonies telling about his wonderful colony and city of brotherly love. Quakers who had suffered in the other parts of America came to live there. The peace between the settlers and the Indians continued for many years. Philadelphia grew and grew and the colony of Pennsylvania thrived. So they were doing very well. By the, by the year 1700, Pennsylvania was one of the richest and most populated colonies. Everyone was welcomed there and the peace with the Indians was something rare in those times. Freedom of worship was granted to all who lived there. The Quakers finally had a place where they could live in peace. William Penn continued to use his influence in England to help the Quakers. He went to England and secured the release of Quakers being held in prison for religious reasons. He spent all of his money and resources on the colony that he started and his peace negotiations with the Indians ensured peace for Pennsylvania colony. William Penn died in 1718. He had spent his life creating something wonderful. He lived his life by the golden rule the very words of Jesus in Matthew 7:12. He had given everything he had for what he believed in most, living peacefully with his neighbor. So let's read together. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. So this is the idea of Matthew 7:12. I hope you have enjoyed our story today. Isn't it wonderful to learn about people in history who really made a difference? Remember, you too can make a difference by living by the words of Jesus. So if you also do to others whatever you would like them to do for you, you can also make a difference. Now let's have a narration break. Retell the rest of the story. What made Pennsylvania so special? So what was the thing that really made Pennsylvania special? Can you think about it? Try to retell the rest of the story. And when you finish, you can look at the, the pictures on the next pages. So on this page, there is a map of Pennsylvania that they made at that time. Penn's Pennsylvania. William Penn accomplished wonderful things in Pennsylvania, but he was not a good manager of money or legal matters. An unscrupulous business manager of his even took advantage of his habit of signing documents but not reading them. Penn actually signed away ownership of the province to his manager, who then demanded huge amounts of rent that Penn could not pay. Eventually the courts would rule that Penn still had ownership, though he had briefly found himself 
in a debtor's prison at the age of 62 over the matter. It wasn't just Penn who faced such challenges. Imagine the lands of the New World, and settlers and explorers from various European countries, all trying to claim parts of the land, sometimes the same parts, all while the Native Americans considered the land theirs. Disputes and conflicts were common. Penn faced several legal challenges, including one over the boundaries between some of the land he owned and Lord Baltimore, who also owned a huge portion of the land next to his. Here you see some pictures of the Quakers in America. So here is a religious society of friends meeting house in New York. And today, if you watch professional baseball, you may be aware of the Philadelphia Phillies, but you may not be aware that when the team was first formed in 1883, they were known as the Quakers, not the Phillies. Philadelphia, in its long history, had another baseball team a hockey team as well as a football team, all calling themselves the Quakers. And this is a Quaker meeting house. And down here, many Quakers took part in efforts to outlaw slavery or helping runaway slaves. Many also refused to take part in wars or conflicts that would lead them to kill or injure others, but many have served in other ways. This is a photo of a friend's member who was a driver of their ambulance service in Germany in 1945. The life and work of William Penn had, has had an immense or a very big influence on our country, on America. Not only did he influence our culture by showing that people could agree to live in peace no matter what the difference is in their beliefs, he is credited for setting an example of encouraging and inviting the humble folk the average worker of America, to build their lives under better conditions with little governmental involvement. His love for his fellow man or his brother set a precedent in, in, in a period of history where harsh judgment and punishment were common. His influence on the settling of the colonies of Pennsylvania, Delaware and New Jersey was extremely helpful in forming the representative type of government our new country would eventually establish under our constitution. We are still enjoying the influence of William Penn on our society. So here is a drawing of Penn's treaty with the Indians and this is what, Pen what um, Philadelphia in Pennsylvania looks like today. Now, let's look at thoughts to remember. Number one. We have learned through our studies of early American history that the Native Americans were oftentimes not treated with the utmost honesty and fairness. Peace treaties were often breached with no consequences for either side. That means when there were peace treaties, they were often breached, with, which means people didn't respect the treaty. So even if there was a peace treaty, there was sometimes no peace because people broke the rules. 
Number two. We learn in chapter eight that Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love, a name chosen by William Penn to show the rest of the colonies and the world that everyone was welcome to live there without discrimination. All right, well, this was our last page for chapter eight. I hope that you enjoyed this chapter and I will see you in the next chapter, in chapter nine. Hello and welcome to chapter nine. William Wilberforce, Ab abolitionist hero. So this is the person that we will talk about most in this chapter. So let's look at the starting points as always. The issue of slavery would be found in the early history of colonized America, but there was a growing awareness of the need for it to end. What is slavery? Maybe you've already heard of it. Slavery looks like this. What is in this picture? So people were working, especially people from Africa, they were working very, very hard as slaves. So they were not really getting paid or anything, but uh, they, were, they were not treated well and they were not really considered as humans. And so began the work of the abolitionists. So what is an abolitionist? These abolitionists are people who are against slavery. So people who don't want this to happen. They say that slavery is not right. It would not quickly be ended and continued to divide the colonies. So some people were against slavery, but other people wanted to keep this way of doing things. Do you think it's a good thing to keep this and to make people work very hard and not consider them as real humans? No. Okay. So let's, let's look at the next part. Sold for a shell. What is a shell? Here are some shells. Different types of slavery existed in Africa long before the transatlantic slave trade began. Africa had also used shells as a form of money for hundreds of years. As Europeans began to purchase slaves, tribal groups fought with one another to get slaves to sell, and the Europeans used cowrie shells as a form of payment. So instead of paying with money for the slaves, because you could just, you, you could buy a slave if you wanted to, you could buy someone, but they didn't use money, they used shells like this. So imagine if you are a slave and you are being sold for shells. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that strange? Okay, let's, let's look at ready to explore. Number one, why did the English and American colonists use slaves? Number two, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace and what did we have to do with William Wilderfo Wilberforce? So let's find out in the next pages. In this chapter, we are going to return to the rather difficult topic of slavery. I know that some of my young friends hearing this story might be very sad or even afraid to hear about this part of our history. Some of you might even be wondering how this could have happened right here in America, the land where everyone is supposed to be free. Perhaps you are wondering why God even let it happen. My young friends, 
so precious to me. I want you to know why I insist on writing about this in our otherwise lovely story. The answer is simple, because it happened. You see, every person living and who has ever lived has the capacity for good and evil. People who love Jesus try to make doing good things their usual choice. So they care for other people and they, they want good things for others. And this is a good thing. So as it says here, every person living has the capa capacity for good and for evil. So let's, let's look at the rest. However, there are times when greed and self-centeredness cloud the human conscience. This happens when we are not thinking or caring about Jesus' love for all humankind. So we're not thinking about others, we are only thinking about ourself. When that has happened in history, there are terrible consequences that have followed. The years of slavery in our country are some of those times. So this is, of course, not a good thing. And because of the self-centeredness of people, slavery started to exist. I hope my friends reading or hearing this story love Jesus and want to follow him with all their hearts. However, it is important for us all to understand that we too have the ability to let selfishness and greed cloud our view. So, do you think it's easy to always be doing good things to other people? Do you think it's easy to always uh, think about others like this person? No, right? So sometimes we are also like this person and we think about me, 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 me first. So we need to be careful that we don't become like this, but that we can become more like this person. Jesus died for all of us and without him, we have all the evil of sin in our lives. So I tell about this part of our history to remind us, to remind all of us of this. Remember, unless we learn about history, we cannot learn from history. Another thing I want you to understand is not all people who owned slaves were evil people. We will learn about some exceptionally godly men and women in our history who owned slaves. So some some people, like this woman, were, were nice to their slaves. They were not being uh, terrible and uh, mean or anything, but they were actually very kind people and maybe also sometimes helping their slaves. So one of these people, one of them, was a man named George Washington, our first elected president. At times, people do things because it is an accepted cultural norm. This means that because it is widely accepted in society, people think it must mean that it is justifiable to do. So, for example, if, if everyone in your classroom is cheating in a test or an exam, if everyone is cheating, then you might think, well, Everyone is doing it, so it's normal. It's, it's nothing bad, so I can cheat too. But do you think this is right? Do you think God likes this, even if everyone is doing it? No, right? Cheating is still bad, even if everyone does it. So the same thing happened with the slavery. So slavery was accepted in all of society so everyone had or many people had slaves but that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do 
Of course, we all know that it is not acceptable to own another human being. So that means if you buy someone with money or shells. But back in the time of the history we are studying, slavery was widely accepted. Everyone thought that slavery, having a slave, was normal. Not all people accepted slavery as normal, though. Today, we are going to learn about just such a man. He wasn't the sort of man you would think could be a hero. It certainly wasn't his childhood dream. I want to tell you the story of this unlikely hero because it is a wonderful example of how each and every one of us can make a difference when we stand up for what is right. The name of our hero today is William Wilberforce. Here is a drawing of him. William did not live in America, but he was painfully aware of a problem that his home country of England and our country America shared. So he didn't live in America. He lived in England over here in Europe. So, slavery was a problem also in England. Remember, slavery started in the Americas a long time before the colonial times. There had been slaves, slave ships pulling up to the shores of America for more than 200 years before William was even born. So, it ha slavery had been happen happening a long time even before he was born. However, before I tell you how our friend Mr. Wilberforce became a hero, I need to tell you about his childhood. William was born on August 29, 1759. His family was of the English upper class. This is another way of saying his family was rich. They had a lot of money. From a very young age, William had everything he could possibly want, including parties, fancy clothes, and a fine education. So he had a very good education. Poor young William was dreadfully spoiled, I'm afraid. So he had everything he wanted. Can you imagine if a child can have everything that he wants? So for example, if you want, if you want chocolate ice cream, uh, maybe six times every day, then your parents, do you think they will give you the chocolate ice cream? Six times every day? No, I don't think so, right? But this kid, William Wilberforce, he could have anything that he wanted. So he became very spoiled. That's what we call someone who can have everything that they want. When William was only nine years old, an extremely sad thing happened. His father died. William's mother was awfully sad and sent her young son to stay with his aunt and uncle who lived in London. So William was not with his family anymore, but he went to another place to live with his aunt and uncle. His new guardians, so his aunt and uncle, were very different from his family. They were evangelical Christians who were involved in the spiritual awakening happening in the American colonies and in England. So they were good Christians, his new family. Earlier in our story, we learned that in England, people were expected to be a part of the Church of England. It was not socially acceptable to be evangelical. So people didn't really like the evangelicals. William was 12 years old when he too accepted the faith. 
and a seed was planted in his heart that would mature into a very firmly rooted tree of faith when he became a man. When William's mother and her high-class friends, so his actual mother with all the money, realized that her son was following in the footsteps of their radical relatives, they did everything they could to stop it. So they tried to take William away from his aunt and uncle because they didn't want him to become like them, to become Christian evangelical like them. In a way, they succeeded and William went back to his old ways. So they managed to take William away, but and William, he started to become spoiled like before. So, yeah, nothing really changed in, in his faith because they took him away. But God was not done with our friend William. He became friends with a young man named Isaac Milner. Isaac was highly intelligent and a respected scientist and mathematician. He was also a strong believer in our Lord Jesus Christ. So not only was he a scientist and mathematician, but he was a strong believer. He and William had many discussions and read the Bible together. The little seed of faith which had been planted years before, started taking root and growing. Soon, William was so convicted, he renewed his commitment to Jesus. So even if William was taken away from his aunt and uncle and became a spoiled child again, he was able to come back to God and to commit himself to Jesus because of his friendship with this man. So let's have a narration break now and you can try to tell the story again in your own words. Try to remember what happened. What was the childhood of William Wilberforce or what was happening with the slaves in America or in England? Can you try to tell the story? You can pause the video. Tell your story, and when you finish, then you can continue the video. Ready to continue? Okay. During this time, William started his political career. He was elected to the British Parliament. The Parliament is part of the English government and could be compared to the American Congress. He had a good friend, William Pitt, who became England's Prime Minister at the age of 24. So he was very young. He was very young when he became the Prime Minister of England. Mr. Pitt would become one of William Wilberforce's best friends and strongest allies. So they were very close, William, and, Will, William Wilberforce and William Pitt. As William Wilberforce renewed his commitment to God, he thought of leaving his political career and becoming a minister. So he thought, oh, maybe I should become a pastor or a priest or someone working in the church. But William Pitt encouraged him to pray about how he could be useful to God in his place in Parliament. After much prayer and consideration, Wilberforce was convicted that God indeed had put him in a place of influence to be used by him. William felt God had called him to lead the cause of abolition. So, do you know what the word abolition means? We talked about it a little bit before. The root of this word is abolish, which means to put an end to something. 
What Mr. Wilberforce wanted to abolish or end was the horrible slave trade that England and her colonies in America were both involved in. So William Wilberforce wanted to end what was happening with the slaves. He didn't want people to be like slaves anymore because that is not something human. So he was against that. Don't you just feel like standing up and cheering? I do. Finally, someone wanted to put an end to the slave trade. So finally, someone was interested to make life much better for the slaves and make them um, get out of slavery, finally. William knew of the horrible conditions in which the slaves were transported from Africa to Europe and America. So they were transported from Africa or to America or to Europe. But the way that they were transported, like in this slave ship, it was horrible. So it made him sad as it does us, to think about the many tribes of Africa which were completely wiped out by the slave raiders. How awful to think about the many civilizations destroyed by this dastardly practice. For hundreds of years, slave raiders made an abundant living of the selling of human beings. What do you think happened when these people who ran the slave business heard what Mr. Wilberforce was trying to do? Most people don't like it when someone else says they are going to get rid of their way of making money. And this is the incredible stronghold that our friend William was up against. So a lot of people were actually making good money. So they received a lot of money because of the slaves. Because they were selling people or buying people. But William Wilberforce wanted to stop selling or buying people. So what does that mean? That means that the people who are selling the slaves, they will not get any more money from their work. So are people happy when they stop getting money? No, right? They're not happy. So that's why there was a lot of problems when William Wilberforce decided to do this. After William made his cause known, he soon found out who his real friends were. Poor William. He was threatened and hated by many people. He received death threats and was on the receiving end of terrible rumours. William did not let this get to him though. He worked tirelessly to put together a bill promoting abolition. In 1793, he, bought, he brought his first bill before the House of Commons. The House, the House of Commons could be compared to our Senate. Here is a, a painting of it. He lost by eight votes. Was all his work for nothing? No, William kept going. He would not give up the cause of freedom. He continued to put together bills demanding the end of the slave trade. Every time he came with another bill, William was voted down. That means it didn't work. How discouraging! Time after time, he presented another bill. Slowly, something began to happen. Little by little, he was starting to gain support for his cause of abolition. The tide was turning. Slowly but surely, he was moving forward. William Wilberforce and his supporters worked, 
worked for nearly 20 years. Finally, in 1807, the vote was in his favour, a resounding win of 283 in favour of abolishing the slave trade, to only 16 who opposed it. He had done it! It had taken 20 years and 11 proposed bills, but he had finally succeeded. So it worked! But William did not stop there. He spent the next 25 years working to completely abolish slavery. He wanted all the slaves in England to be set free. In 1833, three days before he died, William heard the wonderful news. The House of Parliament had passed the bill abolishing slavery in the entire British Empire. Wow, so only three days before he died, he heard the good news that there would be no more slavery in the whole British Empire. I love stories of the faithfulness of God's servants. So that is the true story of how a spoiled rich boy grew up to be an extremely important person in history. William Wilberforce, who married a lady named Barbara Spooner, was the father of six children. He is also considered to be the father of abolition. He was an active member of the British Parliament for 26 years. God had a great plan for him, and I am happy to tell you, he listened. Isn't it simply amazing how one person can have such an impact on history? Have you ever tossed a small pebble or stone into a pond or a lake or even a puddle of water? When I was a child, we had a small stock pond in a back pasture where the cows would come to drink. I used to lie on my stomach on a log that was hanging out over the water and drop small sticks and pebbles into the water so I could watch the ripple effect. This is the ripple effect. So when you throw a stone in the water, boom, then the water starts going in circles like this, right? It's always amazed me how wide and far-reaching the circles would get from the tiniest stone. So these ripple effects, they go very far in the water. It doesn't only stay here, but the ripples continue. It didn't matter how small the stone was, if I dropped it hard enough, it would cause a big ripple. This is exactly what happens in life. Since the creation of man, all humankind has had a ripple effect. Some cause big enough ripple to be felt for a long time afterward, while others are barely noticeable. And just like the stones I used to drop in the pond, size doesn't matter. Even small people can cause a big effect. So even you, even though you may be young, but you can, if you are here, then you can cause a big ripple effect. You can make a difference in our world. We have learned that greed can make humans do bad things. But if we follow the word of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7, we can cause a positive ripple effect. Love is patient and kind. So if we keep being loving to each other, to one another, then we can have a positive ripple effect. Now let's have another narration break and you can say what is your favorite part of our story today? What was the best part do you think in our story from today? 
I'll give you a little bit of time to think about it and you can just say it out loud or write it down on the paper. All right, now we can continue. Slaves in Colonial America As colonists arrived in the Americas, they would sometimes become indentured servants. So what are those? That means that they are forced to work for someone without getting paid. Agreeing to work for set numbers of years for a person if that person would pay their passage to the colonies or pay off a debt. But the cases of John Kayser and John Punch would hint at the dark future of slavery. Punch, an African, ran away from, ran away from with two other indentured servants, though they were European. When caught in 1640, Punch was punished by being legally required to serve the remainder of his life for having run away. The, two, the other two men had their indenture time lengthened, but did not face a lifetime of service. So for them, the consequence was better because they were from Europe. Kayser would face a similar fate. He was indentured to Anthony Johnson, a free black man and property owner. Kayser said that Johnson forced him to work beyond the legal length of time and went to work for another man as an indentured servant. So he worked really too much and without getting paid. Johnson sued the other man in 1655 and the court declared Kayser a slave and said that free black men could own slaves. By 1770, over 273,000 slaves were living in colonies in America. They were part of a vast economy in which slaves would be transported from Africa to Europe and the Americas. Then trade goods like sugar would then be transported and sold. From the very beginning of America, the, first, the question of slavery was one that hovered over its future. It would remain a point of division as America started on the path to becoming a fledgling nation. Now you can have a look at these two pages and you can see the pictures here. So we can just quickly read together what it says. It's all about ab abolition in America. So let's read a mix of laws. The word abolitionism refers to the effort to end slavery and the word is still used today. As the split widened between the Northern and Southern American states over the issue of slavery in the years after the Revolutionary War, the country was left with a wide assortment of laws and legal opinions on the issue that were of, in often in direct conflict. For example, in 1777, Vermont outlawed slavery Yet in Virginia, there were laws in support of the institution and regulation of slavery. So it wasn't the same law everywhere, but it was a bit of a mix. Sometimes laws were enacted that restricted or ended the commerce and industry of transporting and selling slaves, but did not offer freedom to those already enslaved. Some places had no laws regarding slavery, and so slaves in those areas were stuck with no legal status or rights. Slaves didn't always wait for their freedom to be granted to them. Sometimes they chose to rebel, 
to fight for their freedom. Some revolts occurred before the Revolutionary War, such as the Stono Rebellion, the New York Slave Revolt of 1712, and the New York Conspiracy of 1741. These and other efforts often failed, leading to the death of many. So even though the slaves sometimes tried to get their freedom and rebel, but it didn't always work, of course, and many of them died because of that. Let's read The Death of an Abolitionist. Reverend Elijah Parrish Lovejoy was a minister, newspaper editor, and relentless opponent of slavery. Lovejoy was not popular for the stances he took on slavery in Missouri, a state that was already at odds within itself and with its free state status of its neighbours over the issue. Facing controversy and thefts and vandalism designed to prevent the publica publication of his paper, Lovejoy moved to Alton, Illinois. After his printing press was destroyed several times, Lovejoy became even more determined to press the issue of abolitionism. So many people were trying to stop him from presenting the abolition, abolitionist view, but uh, they tried to stop him, but he did not give up. While trying to protect the printing press and his newspaper, Lovejoy was killed by a mob in 1837 and buried in an unmarked grave without a service, while no one was found guilty of his murder. Yet to others in his family and the, the abolitionist movement, he served as a powerful example to do more and to give everything to cause of freedom for those still denied it. So even though he died, because he tried to present uh, the right cause and he tried to fight for what is good. Um, still, his, his death encouraged people to be like him and to work hard for the right thing. So we've come to our last page. So we can look at it together again. Although William Wilberforce did not live in America, he had an immense effect on our country and indeed the entire world. Since the earliest civilizations, the world had struggled through tremendous battles of social justice issues. Issues of slavery, cruelty to children, many civilizations even sacrificed their children to their gods inequality of women and harsh treatment of animals, just to name a few, were front and center in many cultures across the globe. The settling of America brought these world cultural elements here to a new arena. Would they be allowed to continue? Or would there be enough voices raised calling for the abolition of the enslaving cultural norms that victimize the downcast and downtrodden? Brave heroes like William Wilberforce can be thanked wholeheartedly for being those brave voices. Now, let's look at thoughts to remember. Number one, there are a number of reasons that the British and Americans used slaves. One is tradition. The use of slaves and menially paid servants was deeply ingrained in the fibre of the world's cultures, almost from the beginning of civilization. Of course, this doesn't make it acceptable, but at this time in history, it was simply an accepted part of life. And number two, William Wilberforce and John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, were fast friends. John Newton was a former slave trader who had a foundational change of heart. So he used to have slaves and and also sell them, but he changed. This would be a fascinating bunny trail.
if your children are interested. All right, well, I hope that you enjoyed this chapter and that you could understand more about slaves and what it means when, when people try to make it illegal again when with all those abolitionists. I hope that you could learn about that and understand. And I will see you in the next chapter. So see you.